Hey, it is Adam Sewell, MD. In the last episode, we covered how mitochondrial failure becomes the first major driver of biological aging. Today, we are going to take that understanding and turn it into a real clinical protocol. This is a deep episode. We are going to cover urolithin A, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide support, mitochondrial peptides, methylene blue, photobiomodulation, fasting, exercise, and how all of these fit into a coordinated restoration sequence. This episode is what most clinicians never get to see, which is the practical, mechanistic, evidence-supported version of mitochondrial therapy. Let us get started. Section one, the principles behind restoring mitochondrial function. There are three principles that matter the most. The first principle is you must increase metophagy. Old, damaged mitochondria must be cleared. You cannot repair your way out of a dysfunctional mitochondrial network. You must prune the tree before it can grow again. The second principle is you must increase mitochondrial biogenesis new mitochondria must be created. This depends heavily on nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide levels, sirtuin activity, and exercise-induced signaling pathways. The third principle is, you must stabilize electron transport and reduce unnecessary reactive oxygen stress without suppressing beneficial hormesis. The best therapies all support one or more of these three principles. Section two, urolithin A, the mitophagy molecule. Urolithin A is one of the most important compounds for mitochondrial repair. The reason is that it directly triggers metophagy through the pink one parkin pathway. This was demonstrated in a landmark study by Ryu and colleagues published in Nature Medicine in 2016. They showed that urolithin A restored mitochondrial function in aged animals by clearing out damaged mitochondria and stimulating the formation of new ones. In humans, urolithin A improves muscle strength, endurance, and mitochondrial efficiency. Clinical trials using the 500 mg daily dose showed increases in muscle endurance over a four-month period. Higher doses up to 1,000 mg daily have also been well tolerated. The mechanism is straightforward. When PINK1 accumulates on the surface of damaged mitochondria, it recruits the protein PARKIN. PARKIN then tags those mitochondria for removal. Urolithin A increases this process and the cellular energy network becomes more youthful. Clinically, urolithin A is one of the fastest ways to improve fatigue, muscle performance, and cognitive endurance. Safety considerations are simple, it is generally safe. The main issue is that patients with severe dysbiosis may metabolize it unpredictably. In these cases, I recommend starting at 250 milligrams and titrating upward. Section three, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide support. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is essential for sirtuin activation, DNA repair, and mitochondrial biogenesis. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide drops steadily with age. By the time a patient is 60, they may have lost up to 50% of their available nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide pool. This is a major reason why older adults do not tolerate stress. The two primary precursors used today are nicotinamide mononucleotide and nicotinamide riboside. Nicotinamide mononucleotide is usually dosed between 200 and 400 milligrams daily. Some protocols use 600 milligrams daily in older adults or those with high oxidative burden. Nicotinamide riboside is typically dosed between 200 and 300 milligrams daily. These compounds raise nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide through different pathways and there are ongoing debates about which is more bioavailable. In practice, both work. What matters more is the patient's overall metabolic health. You must avoid nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide boosters in patients with active cancer, unexplained weight loss, or rapidly growing masses. Tumors can hijack nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide to support cell division. That is why any patient with red flags must be screened before therapy. For the typical longevity patient, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide restoration is foundational. It increases energy, improves cognitive clarity, and enhances the effect of mitochondrial peptides. Section four, mitochondrial peptides. There are two mitochondrial peptides worth talking about, MOTS-C and SS-31. MOTS-C is a mitochondrial-derived peptide that increases metabolic flexibility and improves glucose handling. It activates AMP-activated protein kinase, which increases fatty acid oxidation and mitochondrial biogenesis. In older adults who tend to shift toward carbohydrate dependence and insulin resistance, MOTC can reset metabolic flexibility. Typical dosing is 500 micrograms two to three times per week. Some protocols dose daily for two weeks during a reset period. Patients generally notice improvements in stamina, glucose stability, and fat loss. SS31 is different. 
It binds to cardiolipin in the inner mitochondrial membrane and stabilizes the electron transport chain. This reduces reactive oxygen species leakage and improves ATP output. SS31 is especially useful in patients with chronic fatigue, heart disease, or neuroinflammation. Typical dosing ranges from 2 mg to 5 mg given subcutaneously, often daily for a few weeks and then tapered. These peptides are powerful and should be used only when the practitioner understands the patient's metabolic, cardiac, and inflammatory state. Section 5. Methylene Blue Methylene blue is one of the oldest neuroprotective compounds we have and one of the most misunderstood. It acts as an alternative electron carrier at complex 4 of the electron transport chain. This means it can bypass dysfunctional sections of the chain and restore ATP production even when mitochondria are partially damaged. In low doses, methylene blue increases mitochondrial efficiency and reduces nitric oxide-induced mitochondrial suppression. It also increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which improves cognition. The typical dosing range is between 1 and 5 mg daily. You do not want to use high doses in longevity medicine. The two major contraindications are patients taking serotonin reuptake inhibitors, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tromadol, or other serotonergic agents because methylene blue can trigger serotonin toxicity, and patients with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency because methylene blue can trigger hemolysis. When used correctly, methylene blue is one of the most powerful cognitive enhancers available. Section 6. Red light therapy. Red light therapy increases mitochondrial ATP production by activating cytochrome C oxidase. The wavelengths that matter most are around 680 nanometers and around 850 nanometers. These wavelengths penetrate tissues and enhance electron transport, reduce reactive oxygen species leakage, and promote mitochondrial biogenesis. This therapy is especially useful for brain regeneration, skin repair, joint pain, and systemic energy deficits. Exposure times vary from 5 minutes to 20 minutes depending on distance and device strength. It is extremely safe. The main caution is to avoid direct retinal exposure with high-powered devices. Section 7. Fasting and Mitochondrial Adaptation Fasting is a mitochondrial therapy as much as it is a metabolic one. During fasting, AMP-activated protein kinase activates. Insulin drops. The body switches from glucose to fatty acid oxidation. Mitophagy increases. Reactive oxygen signaling normalizes. Sirtuins activate. A simple 13 to 16 hour overnight fast is enough to shift the body into a mitochondrial repair mode. Longer fasts can be used strategically but are not required. The key insight is that fasting toggles the metabolic switch from growth to repair. Most longevity patients spend their entire lives stuck in the growth state and never enter deep cellular repair. Fasting corrects that. Section 8. Exercise is the strongest mitochondrial stimulus. Exercise is still the most powerful mitochondrial therapy we have. High-intensity interval training stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis more than almost any supplement. Strength training increases mitochondrial density inside muscle fibers. Even steady-state aerobic exercise improves mitochondrial efficiency. This is not optional. You cannot reverse biological age without exercise, but the patient must be repaired enough to move without triggering inflammation. That is why mitochondrial and senolytic therapy often precede the reintroduction of aggressive exercise. Section 9. Putting the entire mitochondrial restoration sequence together. Here is the clinical truth. The mitochondrial network does not repair itself with one therapy. It repairs itself when multiple therapies are layered in a strategic sequence. The sequence I use clinically and the one supported by mechanistic evidence looks like this. Step 1. Begin urolithin A to stimulate metophagy. Step 2. Add nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide precursors to fuel repair. Step 3. Introduce mitochondrial peptides such as MOTC or SS31 for targeted support. Step 4. Add methylene blue for cognitive enhancement and chain stabilization. Step 5. Use red light therapy to activate electron transport. Step 6. Incorporate fasting to trigger repair pathways. Step 7. Add structured exercise once energy capacity improves. Patients begin to feel better within two to six weeks. Laboratory improvements begin to show within eight to 12 weeks. Biological age markers may drop within three to six months. Section 10, closing thoughts. Mitochondrial restoration is not a fringe idea. It is fundamental biology. Every major theory of aging intersects with mitochondrial decline. 
And every major anti-aging therapy, from fasting to peptides to exercise, works partly because it improves the mitochondrial network. In the next episode, we will shift to senescent cells, the zombie cells that sit in tissue and leak inflammatory chemicals. You will see how senescent cells accelerate aging and how senolytic therapy can dramatically reset the inflammatory environment. This is Adam Sewell, MD. I will see you in episode four.